Hola, bienvenidos a todos. Good evening, how are you? My name is Abelardo de la Peña Jr. I'm Director of Marketing and Communications at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, and we welcome you to En Casa con la Plaza. This is La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, our conversations, presentations, demonstrations, and performances from our home to yours, three, sometimes more times per week. It's our way of fulfilling our mission of telling the little known stories of Mexicans, Mexican Americans, and all Latinos in the founding growth and continuing evolution of the greater Los Angeles region. If you're on Facebook live, welcome to you. As you know, you could always let us know where you're, where you're viewing from. You could chat with us, send us your comments, send us your questions. Those of you on Zoom, the same. We have our chat, we have our Q&A, feel free. We'll probably answer the questions and, uh, and let people know where you're zooming in from or viewing from after the program or after we're finished with the interviews. But tonight, we present our monthly Mexican-American History Maker Session presented by the Mexican-American Cultural Educational Foundation. So to welcome you and to serve as our host for the evening, I present Bell Hernandez, an advisory board member of the Mexican-American Cultural Education Foundation and founder of Latin Heat Media a multimedia media platform. So please take it away, Bell. Thank you. Bell, the mic is not on. Okay, sorry Thank about you. that. Good. Okay, so awesome to have you with us once again. You know our program, if you've watched before, it is, um, it's just an uplifting program about who we are as Mexican Americans in the United States. We are not what Hollywood uh, puts us out to be in their movies and in their TV shows. It's, uh, it's not what we're like. And everyone around the world thinks we're all gangbangers and cartel uh, uh, drug dealers and prostitutes. And, and so we, we, you know, this organization is about educating people that that's not the case. And more and more, I think a lot of U.S. Latinos and Mexican Americans in the U.S. are really figuring out that if we want to change the image that Hollywood puts out there or that anyone who is not of our culture puts out there, we have to do it ourselves. Whether we're in the law um, uh, careers or in the, um, the entertainment careers or in the medical careers, we have to be the exemplary leaders so that people can see who we are and the integrity that we have and that we are just wonderful, smart, intelligent, and people who just want to make a living and, and really just live in harmony with everyone else. So that is the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation. And for um, a year and a half, um, Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz, who is the founder of this organization, has been doing these programs and introducing us, the audience, uh, to some of the most highly recognized and exceptional Mexican Americans in the U.S. And today we have two exceptional uh, individuals. And I want to introduce to you first, um, the person who's going to give us some word, some pearls of wisdom, and that is going to be Julio Vallejo. And Julio Vallejo is going to uh, talk to us about, is it time to end pigmentation discrimination? Okay, so uh, Julio has a lot of experience, and he is the co-founder and the executive director of Pigment, Pigmentocracia an organization with the mission of transforming the narratives of around brown skin and American indigenous people at a structural, institutional, and individual level, utilizing mass media and pop culture as platforms for change and real uh, racial justice. He has a deep understanding and experience on issues related to race, e equity, diversity, and inclusion with a focus on the Latinx experience. He has worked with corporations like Netflix, Oracle, TBWA, among others. And to help them understand, he's worked with them to help them understand and integrate racial inequity in their practices and their contents. Julio has over 20 years of experience as media and entertainment executive in the United States and Mexico, 
having specialized on corporate strategy and market intelligence with a focus on the Latinx market in the United States. He is a founding member of the Maya Cinemas, a company with the mission to develop, build, own, and operate modern first-run megaplexes movie theaters in underserved family-oriented Latino dominant communities. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics and serves on the board of directors of several nonprofit organizations. Since 2005, Julio has been working on vi visibilizing the, and challenge, working on vis visibilizing and challenging the racism in Mexico among Latinos in the U.S. So I would like to welcome Julio Vallejo to our, as our pearls of wisdom, Julio. And I think uh, uh, you're gonna say a few words of Jose Luis, Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz. Well, I think after such a wonderful uh, introduction of, of our friend Julio, I think we should, we should let him um, teach us so much about this very, very important subject, pigmentocracia. Julio, please. Interesting. Hi. How are you? It's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to see you all guys and, uh, and to uh, chat and to talk about very important issues that, that uh, move our community forward. And as Bell mentioned at the Mex Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation, we educate people on who we are so, so they can see beyond the stereotypes. And this is a very important thing, how other people see us but how about how we see ourselves, right? Mexican people. Uh, Mexi Mexican people many times also refer to as brown people, right? And this refers to our skin tone. And yes, not all of us have brown skin in Mexico or people who have Mexican origin, but most of us does. You know, recent studies show that about 80% of Mexicans and people from Mexican national origin have brown skin of some level of, of, of tone. And, and this is a very important thing because uh, it's something that historically has been a conversation that we have uh, hidden, that we avoid, we as people, as Mexicans, we don't like to talk about the racism and the colorism that lives and it permeates among ourselves. We say, no, we're not racist, we're, we're all mestizos, right? With all mestizaje history, this, this uh, a concept that came along during the formation of uh, the Mexican nation to just uh, try to create a myth of homogeneity in, 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 in the country, but pretty much mestizaje, the myth of mestizaje, what it did, it, it, um, it, in, it, 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 it actually avoided the conversation of, uh, of racism among population and it invisibilized uh, the, the African, Afro-Mexicans and uh, actually excluded indigenous people with the promise of making them whiter. You know, the mestizaje, uh, the goal of original of mestizaje was to make indigenous people wider, not to actually create a new race like uh, La Raza Cosmica, as Vasconcelos uh, mentions. So uh, if, if mostly 80% of Mexicans have some sort of, of brown skin tone, then our leadership, our, our, our media, our politics should look about like that, should have that same skin tone distribution. But that is not the case. You know, it's it just enough to tune on uh, networks that uh, that focus on Latino market like Univision, Telemundo, and I'm just going to mention the two two networks that actually do Spanish content, but also we turn into English language Latino content. That is the same case. It, it doesn't reflect accurately uh, the the skin tone distribution of the population. There is there is a there is there is a bias towards uh, widening. To, towards white Latinos, right? And, and we, we say, no, 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 but we're not white, you know? Uh, we are all Latinos. And yes, we are all Latinos, but Latino is a national origin, or Mexican, rather. It's a national origin. It's not a race. And that is where a lot of confusion uh, arises. Uh, we should start talking about race within Mexicans, 
Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna put a really quick example. Everybody knows the actress Charlize Theron. She's um, South African. She was born in South Africa, so hence she's African. She naturalized, she came to the US and she naturalized as US citizen in 2003. And then you might think, is she African-American? Well, technically, yes, she is. She is African-American. So having Charlize Theron at a movie or portrayed at content, does that count as towards helping the African-American community as we know it in the US? Of course not. It's, it's, even, it's even kind of absurd to think that because she's a white woman who happened to born, to born in, in Africa. Well, the same goes to Mexicans, you know? When we talk about Mexicans, most of us who have indigenous uh, heritage are systematically excluded from media, from advertising, from leadership overall. I'm not saying we are completely uh, outside, but certainly we are not in the same proportions as the population mandates. And uh, so when we talk about Mexican and Latinos, we should start thinking about race as well uh, because uh, media representation creates um, unconscious biases in, in, our, in our minds and, and that's how we see ourselves, right? So unconscious bias or implicit bias is something, it's, uh, it's something that how our mind works. Those are mental shortcuts that makes us efficient in thinking, you know, and, and biases, unconscious biases, are based on our background, on our personal experience, on our cultural environment, and media, media. Everything that media shows us uh, adds up to that unconscious bias. And skin tone has a very prominent um, role in this unconscious bias. What do we relate with white skin? It doesn't matter what the nationality is, right? We, we, we see it in our countries, we see it in our home countries, where lighter skin Mexicans are preferred or are related to higher end positions, to better places in society, to the most elite um, uh, jobs in the country, just because they're whiter, because white skin is related. It's, it has been 500 years of colonization that has uh, embedded in our minds this unconscious bias, this stereotype that white skin is somehow better and the opposite to brown skin, brown and dark skin. You know, I'm talking about also Afro Afro Latinos. Uh, dark skin people in Latin America are 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 being related to negative stereotypes, and and this unconscious bias that we come that we have within our 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 our, our society, our, our community, it's very much alive. And the the only solution to overcome it is to acknowledge it. We haven't done so. We need to acknowledge that bias. Once we acknowledge it, then we are gonna be better prepared to create a common front to be more unified. Because how can we be strong if we haven't dealt with a structural issue within our own community, right? We need to overcome and to reach social justice within ourselves that leads to racial healing that we, makes us stronger, all of us. And, and uh, my, my um, advice is don't think that you don't have unconscious biases, not only racial, but of any kind. We all do. That's how the mind works. These are mental shortcuts. That's how we're wired to function. So the solution is be aware that you do have unconscious biases. And, and when those unconscious biases come, uh, you know, uh, uh, appear in your mind, then you're going to be better prepared to identify them because you know you have them. You, you have them and we use them all the time. So the more aware we are about those biases, the more uh, equipped we're going to be to not act upon them. And um, that is my uh, two cents about this issue. What a, what a important subject have you, you just brought to our attention, Julio. I think that, that we, um, we often forget that, that um, the, as you said, 500 years of Spanish colonization in Latin America and many, you know, 300, well, not 500 years, 300 years. And then, of course, during that period of time, you know, there was such a thing as, as, as 
a caste system that was forced upon Latin Americans from all Latin America to get in the belief that the white Spaniards were a superior quality as human. And of course, that's, as you said, that has been uh, uh, wired into our, into our system. So I, we have a um, couple of questions that, you know, the, 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 the audience have, and one of them would be, Julio, what do we do? Yes, you brought to the, our attention the, the fact that we, by just by listening to you and actually acknowledging this in our mind, that's already a, a step forward, right? But what do we do to change it? Because I have to be honest with you, Julio, I think if, if, if the media represented beautiful, in more indigenous looking Latin Americans, Mexicans specifically, it would be, I, I, I can bet you that in a few years, we would all start admiring that much more. So what do we do? Yeah, well, uh, it's at different levels, right? What, what can individuals do in their own homes? We have, we have these uh, biases uh, all the way from the family, right? The abuelita saying, oh, look at that, my mijo, you know, he has green eyes. That's my favorite nieto because he has the green eyes. Oh, esta prietita, we love her anyways, you know? Uh, she's beautiful anyways, even though she's prieta. So all, all these uh, sayings, all these ways of speaking, uh, we know that speaking, speech creates reality, right? Language creates reality. And, and the way we talk, creates a reality. And so we need to start looking into how we talk, how we refer to beauty. I have talked to people that uses interchangeably the term bueno and beautiful. So I said, oh, so was, was she really beautiful? And he said, oh, no, no. I said, so was she, she, was really, she was really blonde? And she says, no, no, she wasn't that beautiful. I said, I didn't say beautiful, I said blonde. Why do you use synonym of blonde and beautiful, right? And this is embedded in our minds. So we need to start looking how we talk. And also, of course, media has a big responsibility because media creates the imagery that we look uh, uh, all the time and they show us how we see or they, they actually, uh, they tell us or they suggest how we should see ourselves and how we see others. And yes, we need to start talking about that because now that that uh, diversity and inclusion is a big conversation. It's not enough to just include a Latino, right? We need to include all, all, all colors of Latinos, but the Latino that has been uh, systematically excluded is the brown Latino. The brown Latino has been systematically excluded. And we need to push more for that because uh, we are just being left behind and we don't see ourselves anywhere. And we just see ourselves when we're the gardener, when we're the chauffeur, when we're the narco, when those, those times they, they do put brown Latinos and, and you know, we want to be the, the Latino who's a doctor, the Latino who's an attorney, the Latino who is a mayor, et cetera. There's, there's, there's one more question, Julio. Um, so in society, you know, currently that we live in, in the United States, um, Indians, uh, uh, Indians from India who are becoming incredibly powerful you know, because of their financial power, because of a number of things. They're, they're a lot browner than Mexicans, but they, their status and their value in society is very different. They, they, the way they are um, perceived, you know, you know, is normal. So, so also Persians, Persians are, are pretty dark, just like Mexicans, but they are perceived very highly in society. People are like, oh my goodness, I mean, this person is Persian, they must be, or, or in Iran, they must be uh, lawyers, they must be wealthy, you know, people actually, how do you explain that, Julio? Uh, I mean, and by the way, let me just tell you that we have two more minutes, so the explanation should be short. But, but the reality is, it's not just about color, my friend, right? It's not, it's not. Color, skin tone, it's a proxy for race, right? It's a proxy. So, so there are other elements involved in racialization of people, like, like, you know, uh, features, height, uh, hair style. We know about bad hair for, for, for uh, African-American brothers and sisters. And so I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the uh, people in India. In India, uh, pigmentocracy is a big thing as well. So uh, my question is, is it that, that question, is it really, are they really um, have a, a higher position in society? I mean, in Indian society. States, in the United in, States, not in India. We know in India there's also a caste system, but of in the course. United States. Yeah, 
Correct, correct. No, I mean, they, they, they have been able to, to go up in, in the ladder of uh, mostly on the technical side, right? We, we know that, that uh, people from India are actually related with high-tech jobs and, and, and engineers. That, that, is, that is where all, all this uh, prestige comes from. But, but I, I would question that, that uh, 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 people from India and, 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 and other countries that have brown skin have actually a, a prestige in, in American society. I, I would strongly uh, question that. I, I would like to have a conversation about it because it's very interesting. Yes. Okay. But friend, I think that, that we, will, um, we will have to invite you again. <laughs> because it is a, 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 an exciting subject and, and we are thankful that you, you took your time. We know you're in Mexico right now doing your work, doing your, your very important work of, of educating society about this issue, which often is forgotten. May I now um, turn and, and uh, ask our MC, our, our, our wonderful, uh, talented, MC Bell Hernandez to introduce our, our we we're very excited, our Mexican American history maker, uh, you know, Armando Duron, Bell. It is my pleasure to introduce our history maker for the evening. He is a gentleman that um, deserves a lot of respect. He is a community leader and he's always very, very supportive of the Latino community in. LA for sure and beyond. Um, our history maker for tonight is Armando Duron, who has been practicing law for the last 40 years and is an acting super, superior court commissioner of the County of Los Angeles. And he is um, a UCLA graduate and following his uh, graduation from UCLA, law school, Fernando was admitted to the bar in 1981, and he began his career as an attorney working in the civil rights um, practice, focusing on immigration and family law. And since the beginning of his career, Armando has specialized in various areas of the law, including child support, family law, criminal law, and immigration law. He has been dedicated to helping the Mexican American community. And in 1992, he was awarded the Frank E. Munoz Award, Mexican American Bar Association of the Los Angeles County for outstanding achievement in protecting the civil rights of Latinos. Later in 2008, he was awarded the Justice Cruz Reynoso Community Service Award from the Mexican American Association of Los Angeles County. In 2015, he was elected by 500 judge, judges to the Los Angeles Superior, Superior Court to serve as the Superior Court Commissioner for the County of Los Angeles. And with this role as commissioner, his priorities in this diverse county have been to serve all litigants and counsel with the respect that they deserve and to serve them with integrity and honesty. And he is also a lover of art and a supporter of artists. I know that of him as well. So he has a love of art and uh, we like that. We like people who support art and media. So thank you Armando Duron for being here with us. We are so grateful to you. And now Dr. Jose Luis Reese, you can take it away. Thank you, thank you Val and thank you Armando. Thank you, uh, um, you know, Commissioner, uh, uh, you know, uh, Juris Doctor Armando. Thank you for, for the, the pleasure and for all the things that you've done for our community. We, uh, we're honored to have you here today. And, and we know that, that this is gonna be a really fun uh, uh, interview or a fun conversation chat because we're gonna get to know, uh, you know, the, the what is that made Armando Duron, this person who has been an activist, who, who has been a, a lawyer, a judge, a, a commissioner, so many things, and we're so proud. Um, so if you don't mind- uh, let, let, me, let, me start, let me start by, by asking a question, and we'll answer it at the end. <clears throat> Why does American wear a tie? <laughs> I won't right. try to answer, I'll wait that's, for the That's end. the question we'll, we'll, we'll answer at the end, but go ahead. <laughs> 
I'm well, getting look, comfortable man, now. I know, I know that, that, that you're a Tejano. I know that you were born in El Paso. And, and I, um, but I also know that you, your family chose to go back to Ciudad Juarez, just across the, the river, as many, many Mexican American families have done over the past hundreds of years, by the way, because Mexicans have been crossing the, the river back and forth for hundreds of years. So your family chose to do that. And, well, uh, not exactly. No, let okay, me tell you well, the story. Tell us, tell the story us. begins in 1928 when my mother was born here in Los Angeles. She was part of the Mexican repatriation of 1931 as a three year old was exiled to Mexico when her parents were deported as part of that Mexican repatriation. So that's how she wound up back on the other side. Uh, then when she got married to my father and uh, when we were all going to be born, there's four of us, she uh, then would cross into uh, El Paso. We were all born in El Paso, but we actually lived in Juarez. So that's how that happened. It's, it, we're, we're part of the history of the immigrant history and the deportation history and the we're coming back anyway history that is our history for the last uh, you know, since at least 1848. That's right. Wow, that's yeah, that's a very interesting story. And and at the, the, my question, my my second question there is, you were in Ciudad Juarez until the age of eight. That means you started school in Mexico, and uh, and then after that you moved to Los Angeles, of course, and and went to school. How was that experience for you? How does that how did that affect you? Well, first of all, you know, uh, I went to, uh, in, in Juarez, I went to school from the first, second, and third grade. And then uh, my mother uh, decided that she had had enough of the, the violence uh, from my father. And she packed up four kids and three shopping bags. And we took a Greyhound bus on a on 11 o'clock bus from El Paso and then came to Los Angeles. We're here the next day in Los Angeles with really literally nowhere to go. Uh, she called some relatives and we stayed there for a while and then we wound up um, uh, it, eventually in the Maravilla projects. So I started school at Riggan Avenue School uh, in the third grade. And that was really an important moment because uh, first of all, having been to school in Juarez, I knew about my Mexican culture. Uh, I was proud of my Mexican culture. So coming to Los Angeles, uh, I was both a U.S. citizen, which meant I wasn't afraid of being deported, and a Chicano who was proud, of, a Mexican-American who was proud of his heritage. So I was in the opposite position of what, where most Mexican-Americans or Chicanos are or were in, 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 this is 1963. Then I go to school in September uh, uh, at Riggan Avenue School and about two weeks later, I find myself walking down the hallway with two other children. And I asked a little boy who was uh, with me, I said, Why are, where are we going? And he says, we're going to another classroom. And he said, how come? I, I said, how come? And he said, because, porque somos tontos, because we're dumb. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, we don't speak English. So we were sent to another classroom because that teacher didn't want us. Um, I immediately told myself, yo no soy tonto. You know, I'm not dumb. And I didn't forget that. I learned English very quickly. I went to uh, uh, fourth grade. And because uh, I, I was a good student, I've, I've always been a good student, I actually was, my fourth grade teacher arranged for me to skip the fifth grade. And I went from fourth grade to sixth grade. In sixth grade, guess who my teacher was? The, the same guy, guy who had thrown me out of, out of <laughs> his classroom in third grade. Well, I'm the kind that doesn't forget. Uh, and so, you know, it was a, a uh, uh, six months of um, jousting back and forth. And he thought he got me. 
because when I went to Griffith Avenue, uh, Griffith Junior High, which was in, in seventh grade, I found myself in what is called the third seat, what was then called the, the third sequence. And so that wasn't where the smartest kids were. So I went home and I told my mother, I'm not with the smartest kids. And, she, and I kept bugging her. She finally took me back to school and I talked to a counselor and he told me, well, it was your sixth grade teacher who didn't put you with the smartest, the smartest students. He's the one who decides basically where you're gonna go. I said, oh, so what do I have to do to get to sequence number one where the smart kids are, the smartest kids were? And, he's, and he said, well, you have to get all A's. So if I get all A's, he says, if you get all A's, I will move you to sequence number one. So first semester comes around, I get all A's. And so I go to him and I said, okay, here's my report card. He goes, okay, I'll, I'm gonna move you to sequence number one. I thought this through. I went back to Brigham Avenue and I, uh, after school, and I knew uh, that teacher was still there. And I walked in one door and said, you see this? I got moved to sequence number one and walked right out the other door and I never went back. Um, so I've always been proud of who I am and uh, been able to stand up for myself. People say I have a big mouth because I'm a lawyer and I tell them, no, I have, I'm a lawyer because I have a big mouth. <laughs> so it's actually the opposite. Because I've always uh, been, uh, you know, found a way to stand up for myself. And, uh, you know, I got in trouble because I would stand up for myself with my teachers. I get kicked out of CCD class with the nuns because I started arguing theology when I was 11 years old. So this is a long pattern with me. <laughs> well, clearly you, you, you chose the right profession, my friend. And, uh, and, we're, and, and I think we all are benefit because of that, because... Uh, uh, you know, fighting for, for what's right and, and being an advocate is something that you've done for many, many years. And, and, we're, and we're, we're very, very thankful for that. So um, you, you mentioned already to us that you have a passion for education, that you, you are a good student. Uh, I mean, you, you have a, an impressive track record as a, as a student. You know, you, you went to Loyola for undergrad or in UCLA as a, you know, for your law degree. Um, tell, us, tell us what gave you that drive? What, what uh, why were you or, or became so in love with education? Well, I, you know, I, I was always a reader. You know, I was, I was one of those people who, uh, those kids who wanted to read and learn. Uh, I, I uh, even in, in Juarez, when I was in school there, I was always somebody that wanted to learn. And uh, that's always been a, a passion for me, even still. I mean, I, I read a lot of different things, uh, uh, you know, even, even today. But I think it really, um, it really begins with a notion of who you are and what you think of your, your, uh, your future is going to be. And uh, we were poor. I'm not going to tell you that we, you know, we had money. We did not have money. That's why, that's why we lived in the Maravilla projects, because we were poor. My mother was a seamstress. She got paid by the piece. Uh, so, uh, so it wasn't, it, 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 it wasn't that, it, but it was a sense of who I was and that I had to do whatever I could to better myself. And a lot of opportunities along the way, a lot of help along the way, Certainly the Chicano movement was very much a part of that in terms of opening doors for people like me. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, that's why I've had a long, a lifelong responsibility to give back uh, because it's not just about me. It's not just about getting, you know, being, being successful for myself, but it's, it's for our entire community. We have a responsibility, those of us who, who have had the education and I've had the best education in the world uh, that I didn't really pay for. Uh, uh, but it was because of the doors that were opened by the Chicano activists uh, and, the, the, and the community, uh, the Mexican American parents and, 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 uh, and those that came before us. Absolutely. And you, you, um, you have uh, demonstrated your love for our community and, and your love for the Chicano movement. And uh, to the degree 
that we know that you are you may have one of the largest collections of Chicano art in, in the country and uh, that only speaks of your love of the for the Chicano movement so uh, tell us a little bit about that about your your appreciation that is evident of, of, of the Chicano movement and that has been represented in, in the arts of the Chicano style art. Well, you know, what, what lasts uh, of any people? It's their culture. That's what lasts. It's their art. It's what they create. That's what we know about the Greeks. That's what we know about the Maya. That's what we know about uh, ancient Chinese art. Uh, it's their culture. So who gathers that culture? Who collects that culture? Who, whose eye is, 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 whose story, who's telling that story? We believed that we as Chicanos, my wife and I, that we had to tell that story. We had to be part of the, of the gatherers of the art and the culture so that we can tell that story from our perspective, not from curators from New York or other people elsewhere, but from our own, from, our, uh, from the perspective of a, of a Chicano and a Chicana. Uh, and that's why we, we've spent almost 40 years collecting Chicano art. Uh, there are hundreds of pieces in the collection. It is a, a, an established collection. People know about it. People study it. Uh, it's written up in books and so forth. Uh, but the reason for it is that we have a responsibility as well to, to uh, present the best image of our, of our community and, uh, and the culture of our community. And it's a very deep culture uh, and, and, and a very beautiful culture as, as, as our artists, uh, you know, as you can see around behind me, uh, our artists, uh, you know, are creating and have been creating for, for uh, forever. You know, I mean, uh, art created by our community predates Chicano art, uh, but certainly for the last 50 years of Chicano art, uh, you know, there's been a lot of artists, a few of them have received some minor recognition but nearly not enough, and certainly not in the breadth of what is being created. And this collection seeks to uh, collect not only just the, the few known Chicano artists, but many others who are not as well known, uh, who help tell the entire story of our community. Um, and, uh, and that's what we try to do with the collection, with the exhibition catalogs, because we have a very extensive collection of exhibition catalogs. We have about 3,500 invitations to Chicano art events. Uh, we have an extensive poster collection that goes with it. We have uh, extensive files on artists, biographies, resumes, newspaper articles. So it's the entire uh, um, way, uh, everything's put together so you can study Chicano art in its true sense, in its complete sense, because it's not just the paintings. It's not about how valuable is this painting. It's about the whole story, uh, the whole story of our people. And it's a, it tells a very important story. I know Bell, Bell reminded us uh, that uh, just last week or, or a little bit before that, there was, it was the 50th anniversary of the, of the walkouts, of the Chicano walkouts. And uh, certainly we, we have a huge debt to to all the people that participate in those movements. You know, we Mexican-Americans who live today with a lot more freedom and a lot more opportunity, thanks to all of those, you know, people that sacrificed and suffered. And, and, and the fact that you're keeping that, that, that beautiful collection available and, and, and you know, telling a, a really good story is very powerful. And uh, wh where can we, I mean, of course, I know right now during COVID, it's, it's impossible to go anywhere and see it, but. Uh, please in, let us know where you're going to have it. I mean, we would love to tell our friends and uh, uh, it would be, I mean, obviously you have it because you, because you want to share it with the world and, and we would love to tell people where to go see it. So uh, as, as, uh, as places open up, please let us know so we can post in our, in our Mexican American Cultural Foundation uh, a page 
uh, you know, so, so people can actually go visit those. Uh, uh, let me actually put it on the screen now that I'm thinking about it for a second. Uh, I would, I would in, invite all of you friends to, to, uh, to visit our, our page, our, um, you know, our, our Instagram, our Facebook at MexAmCEF. And, and if this is a place in which we inform you of our latest activities. And of course, we want to remind you of, of what, uh, you know, our story, our Mexican-American, why we need to have a, an organization that represents Mexican-Americans. You know, we, 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 you know we, we know how important it is because we as, as Mexican-Americans and Chicanos, we have a story that needs to be told. And it's, it's a complex story. So, Continuing on, my friend, um, you know, um, we know that you've been an activist for, <laughs> clearly, as you have been telling us already, you've been an activist, a person that has, you know, uh, help others and, 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 and argue for the benefit of others since you were a child. And we know that, that during school, you became a, the board of the board of governors of the, of the university. You you, uh, you, you were president of Mecha. You were president of the Mexican American Bar Association. You have started many uh, uh, very important organizations that represent Mexican Americans and Latinos. Uh, uh, and so you, you have worked hard to, to represent us, to, to help change that distorted image that we Mexican American Cultural Foundation are fighting. And of course, you've been fighting as many other people have for a long time. And uh, uh, how do you feel about the situation that we're in today? You feel like we, you know, uh, uh, how much progress have we made? And I understand we, we, uh, we, uh, that you, you know, have- we, I get asked that question. Uh, I believe that we've made a lot of progress, but I think that we also have to understand uh, um, the, the demographics of that progress. If you were to take every just the Mexican American population that was here in 1970, and, and not all the people that came after, but just the people that were here in 1970, and say where are those people now? I think you would see that the Mexican American community has made a lot of progress. The reason why it doesn't show up is because we've had all a lot of other people come. So we start all over. Every day, we start all over with a new person who needs to learn English, get a job, get an education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But, uh, and, and so it looks like in a lot of ways that we have not made any progress, but we really have. We have another advantage now, or other, or rather our young people have an advantage now. They have us. You know, our, in many ways, our time has passed as the leadership of, of, a, of any group. You know, uh, I'm 65. I think, you know, somebody else should be leading things, right? Uh, um, but, uh, but, but I'm here, okay? I'm here uh, for any advice, uh, you know, like a lot of other people are. We're, we're here. So, and we have um, not only the, the education, we have economic uh, resources. We have uh, access uh, to to the uh, uh, doors of power uh, that were not available 50 years ago. When I was 15 and uh, helped to found UMAS in my high school, I go back that far, bef even before uh, Metra, um, and, uh, and and then with Metra, and then I was president of Chicano Law Students at UCLA as well. And then uh, Mexican American Bar Association. I helped found the National Hispanic Media Coalition, along with uh, Alex Nogales, who's a previous guest, and a lot of other folks. Um, but uh, and and been involved with a lot of other organizations. Uh, but uh, now it's time for others to be to step up. Young people, some of your audience, who I know is is a large part of why which, why you do this, uh, is for the audience, the young people. And, um, and, and now it's time for them to step up, but they have us. That's a big difference. We, we really did not have people, we had, we had Mexican American leaders, but they didn't have the access, they didn't have the economic clout, 
They didn't have the formal education uh, that we can offer uh, young leaders today. Very, very, very wise words. I mean, absolutely. We, we, and that's why we here at the Mexican American Cultural Foundation, Education Foundation, we're, we're, uh, we, we're trying to remind our young friends and, and the community in general, how many incredibly successful people, you know, are out there that can be great mentors. And you, of course, you know, this video is intended. So, so people will, will, will see you as a mentor and, uh, and will we'll imitate, you know, the things that you have achieved. And, um, you know, you mentioned about the, the, the large number of, of immigrants that continue to come from Mexico. And, uh, the, 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 you know, we, we struggle. I mean, we struggle to see, I, I, I can tell you myself, I suffer every day knowing that hundreds of thousands of Mexican American families are being hurt because they're being deported, you know, out of the country, their moms, their sisters, their brothers. One brother is a citizen, the other one is not, and their families are continue to get damaged. And, uh, um, I, you know, we, we, you know, we, we would be, uh, what, what do you think we could do to change that? You know, we know you have an experience as, as in an immigrant lawyer, uh, an immigration lawyer in, uh, in that, that's a, a powerful thing. Of course, I also understand that because of your position, a judicial position, you 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 know there's certain things that you cannot discuss. Um, right. But within that's true. That, but let, let, me, let, me tell, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story about when I was uh, living in the Maravilla Projects. This is about 1965. I was about 10 years old, and I remember my mother having a conversation with one of the neighbors. And the conversation was about how we, if, if she got picked up by immigration, how we were going to take care of her kids until we got, we, she figured out how she was either going to be reunited with them or get them to where she was at, but how we were going to take care of her, of her kids. And I remember sitting at a kitchen table in my house, listening in on this conversation between my mother and one of the neighbor ladies. Uh, and what I mean to say by that story is that we need to help each other. We need to be there for each other. Uh, the struggle of the latest immigrant is the struggle of my grandmother in 1928. Okay, so it's not just their problem, their struggle, it's my struggle. And, um, and so, yes, I cannot comment on specific things, but I can tell you that I see it as my struggle. And we all need to see it as our, the continuation of our struggle, because that's what it is. You know, I, yeah, it's, it's 1928, 1931, 2020. The story repeats itself, but the difference is that we're here to help. Um. Those are beautiful words. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. We can't forget that just because we, we might be, you know, already uh, in this country, you know, I'm an immigrant. I'm from Mexico City originally, you know, just because I have papers, it doesn't mean that, that, that I, I, we, we can't forget the people that don't, you know, and that they're suffering because of that. So yeah, that's, that's, that's very, very important thing. Um, you mentioned, you know, that you that you were one of the founders of the National Hispanic Media Coalition, which which done a lot of good for the for the, you know, for the entertainment community. And as Julio uh, uh, mentioned earlier, the entertainment, you know, the media has such an important uh, uh, influence in how we think, and 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 uh, so so it was wise that that. The you and Alex Nogales, as you mentioned, have been here before as, as one of our Mexican American history makers. It was wise that you guys chose to to, to be, be involved in that. Um, tell us a little bit about tell us a little bit about how that happened, and 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 um, you know, I know you were president as well for a, for a, you know. So tell us a little bit about that experience. I mean, that's a, a, a well, you know, the, I in um, 1986, Esther Enteria who was another co-founder, 
uh, called me and uh, in my role as president of the Mexican American Bar Association and asked me to come to a news conference uh, protesting something that I believe it was CBS was doing at the time. And I don't recall now the specifics. And I told her that I was not going to go to another press conference. I had been president of MABA for about nine months at that point, And I've been going to press conferences for nine months for this, that, or the other thing. And my sense was that all that happened is we'd have a press conference and make, you know, threats, et cetera, you know, uh, air our grievances, and then that would be the end of it. So I was not going to go to an, another press conference if that's all that was going to happen. And she said, no, no, that's not what's going to happen. And so from that germinated the idea that we would establish an organization. And that's how the National Hispanic Media Coalition came to be. Uh, with of course a lot of other people it's, it wasn't just me uh, or just the three of us uh, bell was a big supporter uh at the time as well uh, for example um so uh um, but it, it was an important organization it is an important organization because it pointed out the failings of the media and and going back to uh, uh mr vallejo and and what he was talking about one of the issues we also tackled was colorism in spanish language media because it was obvious what was going on you, you know the, the telecasters were all you know blonde uh people you know light-skinned people and uh and and that was their their own biases so um uh we we established the organization we we fought uh you know the media with i testified in congress filed lawsuits, we filed uh, um, license revocation petitions, uh, uh, try to stop license, the transfer of licenses from one company to another. Uh, we were, we uh, fought um, Howard Stern and beat him uh, when he went after Selena after she died. Uh, uh, and uh, so we had a lot of successes uh, and I'm very proud of the time that, that uh, I served as president. I was, a, I was the youngest person and they elected me the president uh, at that time. I was about 32 years old, uh, 32, 33 years old. Uh, and, uh, and I was the first president for the first four years of the organization. Great job, great job, my friend. Uh, on one of your statements as a, as a, lit, as a lawyer and in your capacity, you you mentioned you I, something that I found very very attractive. That you said that you one of your your missions was to serve all lit, litigants and counsels with res, with the respect they deserve. Uh, it, it struck to me that you you feel the respect is very very important. Um, tell us a little bit about how how you you have uh, worked towards giving you know, them the respect and of course helping the community to serve the, 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 the correct amount of respect. Well, that, that, I think you got that quote from, uh, from something that what I do now, which, which as a, a commissioner, I hear cases. Uh, I'm, I sit in Compton hearing uh, of family law cases. Uh, the vast majority of the people who come before me are self-represented. They don't have lawyers. 55% uh, are Spanish surname people uh, who come before me. Um, most the demographic is basically mostly poor, low income uh, people. And so um, I'm there serving those people and they are in a lot of ways, my people. I mean, that demographic is me. It's what I grew up with. Uh, I understand uh, what they, a lot of their struggles are about. Uh, I understand uh, from the, the victim's perspective, domestic abuse. I understand poverty. Uh, I understand uh, a, a lot of the issues that, that, that come before me. Uh, but the first thing you have to learn as a judicial officer, I think, is to respect the litigants, uh, to hear them out because most people, what they want is to be heard. They, they, they come to court, uh, oftentimes they, they haven't been heard anywhere else. You know, their landlords, uh, you know, 
causing them problems. Uh, law enforcement may be, may be after them. Any number of things ha are happening around them and they're coming to court. And from their perspective, there's some, some of them are just expecting the same kind of thing. They're gonna get beat up there also. And so right from the beginning, I try to establish that that's not what's going to happen, that they're gonna be treated with respect. And one of the great things uh, that happens right from the beginning is my ability to pronounce their names correctly. Juan Sanchez, Maria Solis, step forward, right? That, that, that shows respect. 55% of the litigants, that already is a step in the right direction. That's already like, okay, their, their heartbeat goes down a little bit because they have a sense that just maybe this person is going to listen. Uh, and, uh, you know, my job is sometimes not, not only to uh, hear them, but to help them tell their story in the sense of, and the way I ask questions to really focus them in because they don't know the law. They don't know what's important. They want to tell you the entire, you know, 20 year relationship. And all I want to hear is a certain part of it because that's the part I'm going to rule on. But I have to uh, focus them in, uh, uh, draw out uh, the, their story, and then I have to uh, make my ruling. And I want to explain my ruling, why I'm ruling this way or that way. And then the last thing I try to do is get a buy-in. Okay, I try to tell, for example, a dad why he, you know, doesn't make any sense for him to have 50% custody. Okay, because what does that mean? Okay. Is your child is not a pizza, and we're going to divide up 50-50, okay? And, and then I go on from there, and I explain to them why I'm making the ruling and try and get them to understand. And most of the time, they do understand why I'm making the ruling. Now, that way, what have I done? I've avoided a lot of the problems that, are, that are sometimes arise when they leave the courtroom and they keep the fight going because I got the buy-in. Um, most of these people cannot afford counselors, therapists, uh, follow-ups, all of these kinds of things that cost a lot of money and time that they don't have. And so my five minutes has to substitute in for all of that uh, in order to get them to buy in and understand uh, uh, why it is that uh, a man should stop beating the woman in, in the relationship because his five-year-old son is learning that that's the way he should treat the women in his life. And he's more likely to be there in dad's chair 20 years from now. And his little daughter, who's three years old, is learning that that's the way the men in her life should treat her. And there's more of a likelihood that that little girl is gonna be sitting in mom's chair in 20 years. And I cannot believe you'd want that for your child, sir. Very, very wise And work. that's when you get the tears sometimes, even from the guys. That's when you get the buy-in. That's when it hits them. And that's when I hope I've made a difference. I believe so. I mean, and, and I can see why the, the 500 judges in Los Angeles, in the Los Angeles Superior Court uh, elected you as as commissioner, and uh, and and of course we 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 would like to 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 soon be able to to say there is a, a Mexican American governor and soon a Mexican American president uh, because because uh, I mean people like you uh, with the wisdom with the knowledge with the experience with the good heart you know. Um, are great examples for the future, for the future successful people. So talking about that, may I uh, uh, ask you a couple of final questions, which is, could you give your, our, could you give our, our audience, you know, many of them are young people, and of course, you know, many of them are, are of any age, they, they may want to make a difference in in the world and, and they're listening to you and they're impressed about your story and they would like to, to emulate some of the things that you have achieved. So if you were to give these people that are listening, you know, maybe 
two pieces of advice, what would that be? Well, the, the first one would be for, for young people is uh, there's an exercise that I, that I uh, ask young people to do when I speak with young people, and that's to go outside tomorrow morning and look up at the furthest thing you can see in the horizon, whether it's a tree way far away or a building or a mountain, look up and see how far you can see. That's your goal in life. But you notice that you had to look up to do that. And you can only look up if you're proud of who you are, if you're proud of your culture. That's what, that's what it's there for, to support you. Your community is there to support you. And you can reach that goal as far away as it might seem if you look up because you're proud of who you are. That's number one. The second is, you know, my goal in life, in considering my, my personal history, is to be the husband I didn't see and the father I didn't have. And that to me is the most important thing. Um, and that's, I, I pass that on to the young people as well, even though they may not be in that place yet. Uh, but I think that being the best parent you can be, being the best partner you can be, is the beginning of a successful career. Because it's not just about the career, it's how do you have a successful life? That's the real goal. It's not the successful career, it's the successful life. And for that, uh, you have to have certain goals, personal goals. And if you had a great father or great parent, then be the parent you saw, right? And if you had a great uh, uh, upbringing, you know, then, you know, bring your children up the way uh, you were brought up. But if that wasn't the case, then do the opposite. But the point is that be the best person you can. Respect everyone because that's the way you're going to get respect. Um, and, um, and I hope that, uh, you know, everyone is successful. Thank you. Thank you. Those are, those are, those are wise words. Uh, Bell, do you have any, any additional notes or questions? Your mic is, is, is not on, Bell. I know Zoom is so funny, isn't it? it, it, it but, um, if you while they're doing that, I'm going to. You're going to tell my, us what. Turn why, my tie back up. And okay. you're going to tell us the answer to that to that uh, question you asked, right? Right. Why go Mexico? Okay. Why That's Why does a Mexican important? Why does a Mexican wear a bow tie? Yes. Right. Mm hmm And you're going to say why? Because he can. Okay. <laughs> I like it. That was pretty fast. That was pretty fast. Thank you so much. It's such a uh, such an honor to hear about um, your life story because you think you know someone, but you really don't until you really start like hearing about their life story. And I learned so much. I learned where your passion comes comes from for helping your community, and uh, we thank you for that. Um, I think that. I heard some pearls of wisdom from you as well that, you know, I carry on and identify and we should all identify is that we need to help the other person. So thank well, you. Thank you very, very much, Jose Luis and, uh, and Bell and Abelardo for having me uh, on this program. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you thank so you much, much, Armando. Thank you, Dr. Lul, uh, Ruiz and Bell. Uh, we had quite a few, a, a big audience here. Uh, Mauritza Jauregui Mandizabal says, Hola Armando, Maria Elena Yepes. Armando, your great story inspires us all. Sonia Alvarado Corona from Tonalá, Jalisco, Mexico, sends her saludos. We have a couple questions here. Uh, from Alejandra Jimenez, does Armando have any advice for an aspiring lawyer looking to practice family law or immigration law? Yeah, my, my advice is to always be honest with your clients. The biggest mistake that family law lawyers used to make that I would see in the courtroom is that they were not 
honest with their clients in terms of what the realities of life are. You're not going to get the kids and keep the other parent away from the kids just because you're not going to get to keep all the property, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Be honest with your clients. That's, that's the, the best advice I think I can give uh, any lawyer uh, or any professional is be honest. Thank you. Julio, don't go away. We have a question for you here uh, from Nancy Marilu Huerta Gutierrez. She's a, she says, first a comment, if of course we Latinos believe that blonde people are beautiful, dark people ugly, from there we despise ourselves. We must eliminate stereotypes and see who we really are human beings. But how do you break these stereotypes to be able to undertake in the US and break the mold of the bad Latino? Well, um, I, I, I believe strongly that first step is to be aware that it does exist. Stop denying it. Just maybe uh, thinking that maybe that it does exist. You know, just create that possibility that there's some bias there. And that opens up uh, a, a whole new level of conversation. Because once, I think these things are like ghosts. Once you expose them to life, they almost disappear. But but it's not enough. That's the first step. But, but it's the very strong and very important first step that we haven't achieved. All right, thank you. And probably for uh, Armando, the hardest question of all, who are your favorite artists? Ah, that's like, ask, like asking me who's my favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not about the artist, it's about the art. Uh, it's about the image. It's about the representation of our community. Of, 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 a, of a particular event or a uh, particular story. That's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for artists. I'm looking for art because that's what represents the culture. Uh, and, but this collection happens to have one of the widest variety of artists of any of the collections around. Well, thank you so much. And from Alberto Juarez, Felicidades to everybody, wonderful presentation. I plan to use this presentation in my class at PCC. And you could catch, for all, who, whoever did not see the entire session, you could catch this session and all of our uh, Mexican American History Maker sessions and all, all of our In Casa Con La Plaza sessions on our YouTube page at La Plaza LA, on our website, laplazala.org, and of course on, on Facebook as well. Upcoming sessions. Here's a great one. I know that you're going to enjoy it, Armando, and everybody else. Tomorrow, uh, when we closed La Plaza back in March, we had just, we're planning to open up an exhibition called Carlos Almaraz, Evolution of Form, from one of the pioneers of Chicano art. Tomorrow, we'll be showcasing his wife, his widow, Elsa Flores Almaraz, will be giving us an intimate walkthrough through the exhibition. And then she'll also speak about uh, her life with, with, uh, with Carlos. Uh, so that's tomorrow, Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Then finally this Friday, uh, the Quetzal family trio. Of course, we know the great Chicano group Quetzal. This is uh, Quetzal Flores, Marta Gonzalez, and their son Sandino will be together on Friday at 7 p.m. to present us with some incredible music. Of course, you can catch it on Zoom and on Facebook Live. Um, and then tonight I'd like to announce to everybody, uh, as you know, La Plaza has an annual gala, an awards gala that we present our Pobladores Awards to pioneers in the, in the Mexican, Mexican-American community. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we were are unable to uh, do it on at La Plaza, but on October 14th, we're going to present the 2020 Virtual Pobladores Awards Gala honoring somebody we all know, Castulo de la Rocha, the CEO of Ultimate Health Services, but also a noted collector of Chicano art. And of course, Los Lobos, East LA Chicano rock legends. You can find information on this. In fact, I'm gonna drop the link onto our chat and also on our Facebook so that you could check it out and join the fun that evening. So with that, muchas gracias, Dr. Ruiz, Armando, Julio, Bell took off, and Micaela, thank you for the behind the scenes uh, uh, 
work that you did, you did great. So any last words? Well, thank you so much, everyone. And we'll see you next month for our next Mexican American history maker. All right. Well, buenas noches a todos. Great to be here. We we'll, we'll hope to see you this Wednesday, this Friday, and for weeks to come. All right. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Take care.